let's get going. Um, I'm Jay Moore. I've been in the game industry about 23 years, so I don't know. I always like to do this just because I'm curious if anybody remembers the first game I worked on besides myself. Anybody besides myself know what the Incredible Machine is? Of course. Just checking. Okay, I got a couple of nods. It, it was it was an interesting title. It was uh, first physics puzzle game. So you actually were doing a Rube Goldberg contraption type thing, and uh, it had gotten delisted from retail. And they called me and they said, "Got to be able to figure out a way to sell this because selling a physics puzzle game on the retail shelf, well, it didn't it didn't work." It, it, uh, so long story probably longer than it needs to be, I put it into all the schools across the country. We got it site licensed um, into almost all the schools, about 80% that had computers back then, and we sold four and a half million units of that uh, contraption maker. So before there was an Angry Birds, <laughs> there was a physics puzzle game. Um, anyway, so I've been doing this, what I've, uh, the thing I was probably most Scene uh, was I did garage games. That was the face of um, the torque game engine, and we we worked. I put a conference together called Indie Games Con back in 2002, and worked with Microsoft to put Xbox Live Arcade into the world, and had a title called Marble Blast that did well on there. So I've been in the indie space for a long time. Um, I now my professional job day job is as a consultant to small studios, helping them get started up. Um, I usually help with the strategic planning, the go-to-market, and a lot with pitches. Uh, pretty much, um, it's it's the DNA of being able to get the deals, be able to get the um, opportunities for any game, studio, or personality, which all of you are. And that's something that you just never you never finish learning. You're always learning about how to improve your pitch, how to get better. Right now, um, I'm looking at actually doing stand-up comedy just to get my ability to work a room to the next level because when you're up in front of a group, getting everybody's attention and where you want to go is part of the process of, in stand-up comedians, they have to read a crowd. It's very interactive. I was thinking when um, Warren was talking about uh, you know, storytelling last night, but that's interactive. Uh, Stand-up comedy, very similar. It's a little different than the poetry, poetry jam, but it's very similar. So what I want to do with this workshop today is make it about you guys as much as about me talking. So um, we've got pretty much critical mass of people we can pull this off with, but any workshop that I do, I want to make sure I'm the one who's facilitating the discussion, but the wisdom of the crowd in this particular room is going to be part of what we're doing. So, everybody have their elevator pitch prepped, because this is going to be about a quick 30 second introduction, who you are, what you do, and why I should care. Those three things. It's the so what of who you are. So, we'll start here, and we'll work our way around the room. 30 seconds. That's good. Um, I am Ryan Schmidt. I went to KSU last year, taking a year off, doing a part of job stuff, and I am a part and code for a game called Tiny Robot. Cool. Feel free to stand up. Feel free to address the entire room. And what, we're, what we want to do is just get clear about how we want to present ourselves and make sure that at the end of the day, I remember that you're Ryan, and that you work at Tiny Robot. I probably forget the KSU, but there you go. Next. Hi, uh, I'm Eric Watson. I'm a junior game design major at KSU, and I'm also working on Tiny Robot with Ryan, and we're trying to put it on mobile. Okay. Eric is going to mobile. Okay, we'll go this way. <laughs> I, I am the Joe of Puzzles by Joe, and right now I've actually just released my fifth game in my semi-popular uh, Clutter franchise that's doing well enough that all five versions are now in the top nine at Big Fish Games uh, Britain teaser section, and they are the largest distributor of casual games, if you don't really count Facebook. Now, so. All right, uh, I'm DJ Curtin of Sloth Rocket Games. We just put out our debut game, Congo's Coin Pusher. Uh, it's on Apple and Android, and I'm excited to promote it. 
look like the guy that does my artwork. I also do work for Jim. <laughs> when you're capturing somebody's attention and trying to hold it, make sure that you go up and you project. So just a little bit of feedback. I won't have time for everybody, but so at the end there, you kind of went there. Okay. And Good so enough. pull it up. Mm. Me? Yep. Uh, Feel free to stand up. We want to make an impression. <laughs> I, would, I would invite you to stand up. Push your comfort zone. Um, my name is Quentin Payton. I'm a senior at Alfreda High School. Um, yeah, and I'm here. I don't know what to say about me. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to make games. Okay. <laughs> and you're so passionate, you're going to put up with everything it takes to be a game maker. Um, Cause because it, 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 you will have scar tissue when you're done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. Okay. Sometimes it'll only... yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Sean Hayden, I'm with Greenbrier Games, a small indie board game company. I'm also leading a project with Auto Attack Games, who's going to hopefully be one of the next big uh, MOBA genre titles out there. Hopefully, maybe? Hopefully. That's a lot of conviction. Yes. <laughs> absolutely going to be the best. Uh, There's a lot of competition, so it's hard to say absolutely. That's all right. You know, if you're going to win, you're not. You don't want to be number ten. Yeah. <laughs> you want to be number one. That's your. That's your ambition. Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Drew Silvey. I uh, do pretty much generalist, broad spectrum. I've done animation to programming. Uh, about 10 years programming and uh, game design in my free time. And I don't have any projects I'm pitching, but I'm working for a marketing company right now. Okay. And I'd like to do more with Interactive. So. Does the marketing company have a name? Uh, CSE. Okay. Go ahead. Good. We'll gra grab him and then grab him. Next. I'm Sean Fieser. I um, am a hardware support technician for Lifeline Repairs. I'm currently uh, in college getting a programming degree to go in. Can everybody hear it? Cool. I'm Clint Heidinger, currently employed by IRES. Um, I've got experience in the game industry, motion capture, and film industry. Couldn't hear the last part. Film industry. And film. So motion capture. Uh, it's yeah, your well, passion. Not currently, but I did do that for the last five years. Okay, so I'm Brandon Snyder. Um, I just graduated from school. I professionally trained in biology, so I'm molecular. Um, so genetics. And, um, I've been a hobbyist game developer for some time, and I'm working on independent projects right now, and working for a day job. Okay. I'm Sanjay with Pulsewave Labs. We have an app called Breath Flame. It turns your bio data, like your breathing patterns, your heartbeat, into visual snowflake model that you can share, compare, and collect. Two sides of the room, but that was good. Um, I'm Marcus Lerkman, and uh, I'm currently a junior at Alfred High School. And I don't have a job, uh, but I plan on uh, becoming a game designer. I'm Bailey Whitman. I'm a 3D character artist. I'm currently a software instead and project lead and the main artist for this upcoming mobile project. And in stealth mode, or are you talking about? <laughs> Is it in stealth mode, or are you talking about the project? Um, um, the working titles, Wings and Perditis. Okay. I will remember that. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Hey there, my name is Austin Joyner. Uh, I am a business intelligence consultant by day and game developer by night. Uh, I'm a Georgia Tech alumnus, and uh, I hope to one day make game design my day job instead. And he'll be running the rest of the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brian Miller, uh, founder of Zatmel Games, working on educational games, currently playing drums for a living. For a living? For a living, yes sir. Congratulations. <laughs> For the past 10 years, it's been awesome. But... <laughs> Hi, I'm AJ Gerdich. I'm a student over at KSU. I do programming and 3D art for the most part. Currently, I'm a TA for C++. Fantastic. Uh, I'm Jack Zachwitz. Um, 
I'm an independent developer, really doing my own thing, and I teach code to kids part time. Great passion. Hi, I'm Leah. I can stand. I'm Leah Knighton, and I'm the co-founder and narrative director for Kerchuk Games. We create social cross-platform games for women. Cool. <laughs> Hello, I'm Joseph Yarrow. Uh, Project. Yep. Hello, I'm Joseph Yarrow. I'm uh, a student at DeVry University, about to graduate uh, in three months. And I'm currently working on a project with a small group uh, on a horror game called Sweet Division. Hi, uh, I'm Drake Greer. I'm Colonel, sorry, Reese alumni of Georgia State University, and I work as a writer for Spray and Pray Studios, uh, working on our first game, uh, Raven Emulation. Person that just came in, anybody else? It's introduce yourself, what you do, and why I should remember you. My name is Rupert Magnot from Burnout Game Ventures, where we can debate game ideas from zero to sales in six months or less. Uh, I'm Warren Spector. Uh, I've made 24 games in 30 years. Uh, I've pitched a lot more than that. Uh, and I have uh, a lot of things I like saying about this stuff. I've been pitched a lot of games, so I think I can add something to the conversation. Great. I'm Colton Spross. I am the co-founder of the Stork Burned Down Studios. We're a small indie company here, and our game, Home Improvisation, is about building IKEA-style furniture without any instructions. Mm -hmm. And we're excited because it just got into Indiecade. Cool. Uh, so you're there next that's week. Mm -hmm. I'm Zach Ginn. I'm a senior at uh, KSU on the Marietta campus. Uh, I use the Unreal Engine 4 and do C++ programming with it. I've also dabbled in 3D modeling. I'm a C-sharp tutor uh, for the Unity uh, freshman, and I also am a closed lab assistant for the professors teaching Unity. So you're so in both camps? Both camps. Unreal and Unity? I'm trying to bring diversity to the school where Unity is pretty much the only thing that's around. Uh, my name is Brandon Pollard. Go ahead. Uh, recent graduate uh, from AI for Game Art Design. Um, Doing 3D maps right now uh, for Student Bridge and uh, trying to start working on my own indie projects. <laughs> Ron Williams, second associate producer for WMS Gaming in Chicago, also uh, the founder of Aurora Game Development Club. My primary mission is to uh, work with students and help them to uh, transition from the classroom environment into the professional environment within the game industry more seamlessly. Fantastic. I'm Keith Fuller. Game companies typically have a lot of issues with communication and how they treat people, largely stemming from leadership problems. I fixed those. All the way in the back. I'm Brendan Packer. Uh, I work at Sloth Rocket Games. I bounce around from doing uh, graphic art and doing web. What's your passion? I like doing UI. I think that's what I'm most passionate about right now. Fantastic. Uh, I'm Tyler Henning. I'm a senior at KSU. Uh, I do game design. Uh, volunteer here today and maybe help you. Fantastic. Hello, my name is Brent Greenwald. Um, I'm a student from the University of South Alabama. Um, I am dual majoring in electrical and computer engineering and I'm here to learn for, uh, more information for our club, the Video Game Development Club, to essentially improve it. Okay. Uh, I'm Josh Dunn. Uh, I just graduated from school, work at Blizzard Entertainment, um, doing Fantastic. IT. Hoping to get into game design eventually, but it's a process. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Philip Kamen. I'm a CS major at the University of South Alabama. I'm also the president of the Video Game Development Club there that he founded. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlotte Mattier, um, physicist turned game developer, and my current project I'm starting a, um, my own game studio, and our focus is on taking tap into the indie um, comic book and web comic um, industries and taking people's ideas and using that as a good narrative foundation. Got an introduction right for you. My name is Merlin Matthews, and I am currently a C sharp um, developer and blender artist in general. I'm largely self-taught, and I am my main focus is game development. I don't get blunder very often. Congratulations for having won that fight. 
Hi, I'm Jonathan Egbert, I'm a co-founder of Anger Hanger Games. Uh, we have a booth in the uh, indie cluster, um, so you should go check our game out, play around. Does so um, have a name? What? The game. The game is Gridmasters, sorry. <laughs> um, and it's a uh, local multiplayer, uh, at the moment, uh, ter not turn-based, sorry. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Grid-based fighter. Um, that kind of pulls a lot from Mega Man Battle Network, but also has more real-time elements that make the multiplayer experience um, more fast-paced. So. What platform do you do a local multiplayer on that you're expecting to exploit? Um, we're doing we're doing PC right now, but we we actually are in the process of doing a, a network update that Great. should hopefully be out by the end of this month. Cool. Um, yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anthony Onukuli. I am a game designer, currently attending Kennesaw State University. I am a lab technician, secretary of the Game Design Development Club, and I'm here to make games. Fantastic. Awesome. Hello, sorry if you can't see me, I'm in the corner. Um, I'm Amber Gordon. I am marketing coordinator for the fifth largest retailer in the world, the Home Depot. Um, I currently work with the technology systems within it, so solar, um, HVAC, water heater, water treatment, all that stuff. <laughs> I also was the president for Ron's fantastic organization down at George Summit University. So. Fantastic. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Tippins. I'm also a student at KSU in the game design development. I um, already have a bachelor's degree in media production, but decided I wanted to get into game design because I like the programming aspect better. I'd like to change the face of game, des or game design to maybe include some more women. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to be hard at this point. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm Tim Olchenbruns. I'm a game design student at KSU. And I am project leader for a six-man team uh, developing game this year. Cool. Go. Um, my name's Hank. Uh, I have a background in character art uh, for CG uh, in Hollywood. And I'm currently art director and co-founder of Shiny Bolt Games. And I'm work working on our project Prisma, uh, which is also an indie cluster. If you guys want to check it out. It's a side-scrolling puzzle platformer that's very colorful, and the lead protagonist is a woman. <laughs> I'm Renee Blair. I'm a game designer at the Danae Sams Gaming Academy, and I am currently working on an unannounced title. So, did I miss anybody? Anybody come in while I was um, not looking? I, I don't know you. you Hi, Introduce I'm, yourself. <laughs> um, I'm I'm Alex. I'm a writer currently. Um, I, I run my well. I'm not a game in games yet, but I would like to be. Cool. So you only have one chance, as they say, to make a first impression. And when you're thinking about what you want to do in life, a lot of times it's important to be ready to do your elevator pitch. And that's just the thing that you're working on right now that you're trying to capture their imagination. And I actually have, usually at any one time, a dozen different pitches I'm doing. So I try to make sure it's somewhat useful to the person I'm talking to. But I'm ready at any time to present and have a dialogue and discussion about the thing that I think is going to be most useful in meeting whoever I'm meeting. And that's, that's, not, just, uh, that's not just when you're going to a meeting and you're ready to do a pitch, that's in life. It's just when you're engaging with people, finding that common ground, finding the thing that you mutually have a, uh, a shared interest in is, and I'm not saying you always have to be on and selling something, but what you need to be able to do is communicate or be articulate about who you are and why they should remember you. It's, a, it's one of those things where, and it's kind of networking 101, terms of finding mutual self-interest. It's also when you're when you're working towards building a relationship, um, there's a lot of people that you encounter in life. If those if there is some level of resonance between the two of you, there's some reason for you to stay in touch, having made a good first impression, you're gonna more likely be able to continue that and and have a, a stronger ability to get 
a partnership or some level of, of connection happen. So the, the workshop um, is about how is it that you go about pitching yourself, which we've already kind of started on. How do you pitch your studio? And, and I think the last one was pitching your game. So we've done a little bit of that already. I know some games that are in work here. Uh, looks like you guys are in the enviable position, most of you, not all of you, but where you're just starting your, your journey in terms of have your entire uh, careers ahead of you in finding those projects you're passionate about, finding the people you want to be uh, working with, and making those things happen. And so that's one of the, one of the things that in life you, you have to realize you only have so many pitches in you. Um, you're going to make a lot, but once you get the pitch done it's, it, and it's successful, that's a rut you're going to be in for a long time. Uh, so I always say pick your projects and pick your people carefully because you're going to have to live with them uh, if you're successful. And that's, that's where once you've found something that you really believe in and you, you're willing to bleed on it and it's something that you can't not do, you're going to be much more persuasive when you go to tell other people about it. There's a big difference from somebody who comes in, and, and I've had a thousand pitches, but just in the last year, I've probably seen between 24 and 30 people with a uh, mobile MOBA killer, right? They're going to they're gonna make the next uh, massively uh, online battle arena mobile title. And it, it's kind of like the FP, what FPS was years ago. Everybody was, or, or, or they're, they were going to make the next MMO. Um, and Usually it's because they think there may be a market opportunity, but it's not because that's the game that's in them that they have to get out. They have to put on the pixels on the screen and make it uh, uh, fun. And a lot of times they're what I would consider bad Unity tech demos. Um, and, and immediately it's easy to triage those pitches because there isn't any passion. There isn't any conviction that this is the game that's going to... And there's a few where it's like, okay, I see the conviction, but then the understanding of what the scope and potential of them actually pulling off that project, how they're going to get it to market, uh, the team isn't necessarily there that I can believe in. So, you know, we just went through an investment conference here, and there was a $1,000 bounty, and I asked the judge, a couple of judges afterwards, so any of them that you'd pull out your checkbook and write a check for? Not yet, you know. This was this was a good year, but it wasn't anybody. And you know, that's that tells me where the uh, new venture ecosystem is in Atlanta. It's maturing. It's getting closer. There, you know, not that you had every uh, new venture here, but at least for what this conference was able to pull in, they were getting their pitches to a point where they were ready. There was enough that were ready. You could go to angel investors. There weren't any winners yet, and that's not just. Not to be discounting, I've, I do new venture uh, stuff all around the country. Probably the best stuff I see these days is not in the Bay Area. I see really good stuff in Seattle, really good stuff in Austin. Um, there's actually quite a bit going on that, I, and this is just my awareness of what's going on. Some interesting uh, new venture coming out of um, LA and San Diego right now. And again, these are people pitching for angel seed money, but some of them are raising a million, two million dollars for projects that five years ago there wasn't any cash on the table for that sort of thing. So, not to translate that to the game space because um, games don't profile well for traditional capital. Um, so, moving on, um, I want to make a quick list. What are the areas that uh, you as an audience have, you as, as workshop members have that you'd like to learn more about. And let's start a discussion here around those. When it comes to pitching, so... When it comes to pitching uh, in general or, or your own project, uh, there's a little saying I like to go with, which is FIFA, you know, find a need and fill it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to branch or, you know, how, how would one expand their idea and, you know, be able to shorten it into, let's say, the typical elevator pitch. Find a need and fill it. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to figure out uh, how A went into that. Uh, oh, FANFA, sorry, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said it wrong. <laughs> 
So, how does the elevator pitch go with with the? Uh, We've all got our great ideas, and a lot of us are very passionate about it. But you know, uh, when it comes to you know, let's say you, there's an investor that just popped up, you you have an opportunity to try to catch his attention. You don't want to throw out a five minute long pitch because you're going to bore him to death. You know, how you do you want to catch his attention right away? So, so I, I, you know, let's summarize the idea. Yeah, you know, that's kind of what us. Yeah. So, um, and Warren is probably one of the best at this. You got to create the hook, right? You right. got to you got to get the high concept right. I'm terrible at that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we can tell. No. You know how to get to the soul, but the sizzle is it. so that's one of the we talk a lot about um, sell the sizzle, not the steak. A lot of times uh, in people's pitch, especially in the elevator, they'll get lost in the details of what they're doing rather than keeping it at something that one is memorable. Two is captures people's imagination. Um, it's one of the things about the high concept of this meets that only this. You know, you've got two things that people might know. Um, it's a little bit trite in the game space because it's really hard to say. You know, this is uh, uh, Mega Man meets uh, Minecraft, right? And you know, something that. You just can't make the connection to, but you, you want to get that, oh, and if you can let the audience, the person you're talking to, have the aha moment of, oh, I get it, without te <coughs> telling them exactly what it is, it's going to be much more persuasive because then they'll buy in to the idea when they believe like you do, this is, this is interesting, this is something I want to hear more about. So it's, it's capturing their imagination and getting them to remember you. So it's something that, um, in terms of your elevator pitch, uh, I'll, in many cases, start, and I'll spend as much as two or three weeks to refine it, to get it down to the number of words that are absolutely necessary. And then you keep practicing it. You see what works, what doesn't. Yeah, one of the things that I've found is uh, some people respond really well to elevator pitches and some don't, yeah. which leads to uh, my number one rule. Really, you hear this, you've heard this a thousand times. Um, one of the things that's most important is uh, we call it reading the room. We talk about that a lot uh, at the Dina San Pietro Academy. Um, it's about knowing your audience. Uh, for me, I won't even look at a pitch unless I get specific kinds of documentation ahead of time. I want to know what you're going to be pitching, so I have reasonable responses ready when you when you get up there. Um, at Disney, if you don't show visuals, you're dead. Uh, there are some people at Disney that won't look at a PowerPoint deck. Yeah, they they just won't even look at it. They'll they'll drum you out of the room. Uh, at IDOS and uh, uh, EA, uh, they insist on PowerPoint decks. Uh, if you're talking to a VC or an, a potential investor, they want to see financials, uh, whereas I could care less. Uh, right. So find out who you're pitching to, and uh, when we talk about this in, in our one of well in our class, uh, a lot of people say, "Well, how do you do that?" You ask them. <laughs> yeah. uh, people know what they want, and uh, you can find that out, and it's really important. If someone hates elevator pitches, don't give them an elevator pitch. Okay? <laughs> what if you yourself hate giving a pitch because? You, you hate you hate the smoke and mirrors over the substance. Um, I, I, I want to know. I'm specifically here. I want to know how you pitch on past performance and cut through the bullshit that all the other pitchers seem to be uh, slinging. Because that's the problem I've had in my whole career. And so I, you're, I wanna, you're not about the that. you're not about the spin. Correct. The spin is bullshit. You, you want to have? How do you have authentic messaging? How do you, how do you actually communicate something that's real? <laughs> Correct. And not oversell? Correct. Not, not Correct. Yeah. I think uh, there's a pretty strong allergic reaction now. Go ahead. I, I, tell me to shut up. No, no, no. We'll, 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 we'll keep doing this. This is, I'll, all, I'll, this is how I work shop. I like talking. Yeah. Um, how do you sell past performance? Uh, you yeah. don't sell it. You make it part of your pitch, right? Uh, one of the other important things about but, but, uh, about pitching yourself. Hold on, I'm not <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand what you just said. You what? I thought you, that sounded like you just reworked. That is the crux of it. How do you pitch your past performance? I'm getting there. 
Okay. <laughs> uh, what, what you, well, what I, I always try to do and what I always want to hear uh, from people, whether they're interviewing for a job uh, or they're pitching a product or they're pitching a company, is what we call backstory. What is your backstory? Uh, what is the thing that's going to make them remember you specifically? What is the thing that sets you apart? Uh, and for you, I, I'm not saying what it is, but you said you made five games already. That's part of your backstory. Make sure they hear that. That's, that's all you have to do. I mean, I've made 24 games. Uh, here are some of the titles. They've been, they've been successful. I've made money everywhere I've gone. Uh, that's part of my backstory. That's why people are going to be enthusiastic and confident that I can pull off whatever it is that I'm, I'm saying I'm going to do. And that's, I mean, that's the fundamental of, of pitches, right? You're trying to build enthusiasm and confidence that you can pull off what you say you can do. Did that answer your question? Hey, so may, go, ahead, go ahead. If I may add to the conversation, uh, I've been pitching for a long time. I've learned from the best. And uh, I don't know if I've, I've accomplished that yet, but um, the, in the elevator pitch, the two things that I uh, learned was, number one, name, same, claim to fame. So name, Rupert Magnot, same, I'm an investor, claim to fame. We think of a game idea of zero sales in six months or less. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I like uh, is you got to hit them between the eyes. You got to come up with something, something that you got to. Sometimes you got to reach down inside and yank it out of yourself. But you've got to come up with something that is absolutely true about you and what you feel about yourself and what you offer, and come up with a way to say it that hits them between the eyes. And uh, because that elevator sh speech is all about getting them to ask another, ask you, oh really? Yeah. Right. Tell me more. Tell me more. Okay. So when you do the name, same thing to fame, come up with a way to say it that makes you stand out from all the other thousands of writers and artists and programmers and so forth, and and that right there gets you noticed and gets and, and moves forward. And what he and what, what Warren was saying was the, the, about the backstory, that's that goes into the social pitch, which is like a, a, a ninety minute type or ninety second type of a thing where you go into uh, uh, talk about you know what gives you the, the, the chops to be you know doing what you do, tell about traction, and then what we uh, an important part is the big why. Why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Okay, because if you're not helping others, what the hell good are you, right? And, and then and then reputation, what other people say about you or you know things like that. So in 90 seconds you can you can pop something out there and really and really make it work. So I, that's just my two cents. Yes, building on that, it, everything you just said is absolutely true. Um, but when I say backstory, I mean something, um, all of that and one thing more. Hmm. It's, you see a thousand pitches. You see a thousand pitches. Why are they going to remember yours? Why are they going to remember you? Yep. So when I, I mean, the day I interviewed for my first uh, game job, uh, I said, I mean, it, it came up naturally in conversation, but I said, you know, I'm, I'm about to drop out of a PhD program to join you. When I left that room, I was the guy who was dropping out of a PhD program, and everybody else who interviewed for that job was irrelevant. Yep. Because half an hour later, the guy I was interviewing didn't remember them. Yeah. He remembered that one thing about me. So what's the one thing? You can do it in 90 seconds. I got my last job when I was interviewing them, and they said, oh, the classes are starting in, 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 uh, in six weeks. I, I had all my stuff on the table. I grabbed it all, put it in the folder, shut my case, buttoned everything up, said, call everybody else that you got scheduled, tell them, to, tell them you found your guy, and let's get started. Yeah. One, one other thing. Did you hear the enthusiasm in his voice? Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay. He's expressing uh, his passion for what's going on. It's not just that passion about your project. It's how you present yourself. If you're not excited, if, if your presentation is, well, you know, I don't really want to stand here, <laughs> but I've got a really great game, no one's going to care. You know, you've got to be comfortable standing up in front of people and talking. Oral and written communication skills are absolutely vital. Uh, and in a pitch, oral is, is where it's at, right? Yeah. So what I always, this is crazy, and no one in this room is going to do it, because I don't think anybody has ever taken this advice. Joint Toastmasters. 
Oh yeah. Learn, been there, learn, done yeah. that. Learn to speak Got the in front of people. Oh yeah. yeah. Because you need to do that, yeah. and uh, everybody at the DSGA will get that chance. If I may add to that, though, um, the way to really again, what he said is excellent. Does everybody know what Toastmasters is? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. just check it. Okay. The, what you need to do is put, imagine yourself five years from now and what you're doing and how happy you are. Yeah doing the thing that's just making you, you just wake up in the morning going, damn, I can't wait to get to work. Yeah. <laughs> and then reach down in there and pull that feeling out and then show it to people now. Yeah, no, that, absolutely. I mean, if you don't know what you want to be when you grow up, figure it out because yeah. nobody else is going to make that happen for you. I'm going to go here before I go there. <laughs> you're, 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 obvious, you're obviously, yes. <laughs> Um, I wanted to just say something um, on on the topic that Warren brought up, and you had touched on a couple of times as well. As far as what I wanted to get, out of this I can't topic. hear you as a note. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I wanted to get out of this conversation was just talking about framing in general. I mean, we touched on it earlier, and you touched on it as well. Um, you know, I've personally gotten into a point where I've tried to find that like silver bullet or that one size fits all. Uh, model for pitch, and there's no such thing as far as I'm concerned. So, being able to frame that conversation, that pitch for the audience that you're speaking to, is a huge thing. And I think that's something that once you hear, okay, let's pitch something, let's have an elevator pitch, you always know, okay, I need to do something. But especially for students, right? I'm thinking about this from a student's perspective. Mm -hmm. You think from the book way, okay, I need to have some type of pitch. But then once you start getting out there and doing it and you have that experience, then you start to understand, okay, certain people are looking for certain information in that pitch. How do I tailor that for the person that I'm speaking to? It's a guy named Mark Long. And have you ever seen any of Mark's pitches? Mm -hmm. He'll build a book. And it is amazing. It, it, you want to eat it. It's so pretty when you're looking at it. And, and he'll build this up in such a way and he'll bring it in and he won't open it when he's doing his pitch. You want to see what's in there because and it's not a leave behind necessarily. It is it is an engagement thing. But he builds a package and I just got done with a group that's launching a new platform for interactive graphic novels and they sent me their investor pitch and it was just that. It was a script of who their company was and what do they want to be when they grow up and how they were going to do it. And it had nothing that a standard deck would have that you're going to send to a traditional angel investor. They're looking. They know their audience. They know who their uh, perfect investor would be. And it's going to be that guy that believes in what they're doing as strongly as they do and can't not be part of it. And they've, it's, it's, I mean, I drooled when I, I mean, literally, it's, uh, it, it's done in unity, and it, it, it has interactive movement and all this. And I'm like going, how can you not get that funded? You, know? you just have to get it in front of the right people. And that's, that's probably the hardest thing to do, mm -hmm. is, is to learn what you're looking for. And I, I have a little bit of zen in all this. Knowing what you're, you're after and figuring out how you're going to get in the way of that in terms of the universe. Where do the people who are most likely to be interested in what you're doing, where do they hang? What do they do? How are you going to network with those individuals? Then it's packaging. And it's, it's a lot about putting the eye candy together, the conviction. You know, you were talking about how do you establish your credibility. You know, a lot of that's about you know who you belong. Who who are the other people that you're bringing alongside yourself? You're known by you're known by the company you keep. So if you've got a team that you believe in and that other people are going to believe in, that also uh, adds that credibility factor. But yeah, there's there's lots of ways. And I hate PowerPoint. I mean, <laughs> I, I I just so much. I did my last session uh, in Prezi just because I wanted to see if I could get it to to flow a little bit better because I I just. I find it so stilting. Anybody else played with Prezi? Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. it's an, it, you know, it, it visually a little bit more interesting. There's a lot more stuff you can do, but it, it tells a story. You take people on a journey. It's much less about trying to transfer information from one human to another. It's how do you capture their imagination and get them participating in what you're communicating. Wow, is the game engine for presentation? Um, the load time is a problem in some situations. That's the only thing I've already have preloaded then. <laughs> Good. Unless your game is finished, 
showing your game is the worst thing. That's to true. Do. No, uh, yes. Because the people, game. you will never pitch to anyone who gets work in progress. Right. Ever. Even Ever. people at other game yeah. studios, they will look at that, and that is the only impression they will have of what you're trying to do. Oh, and, wow. It, and it, and it, this is a really hard lesson to learn. I've, I've spent my life doing it, and when I had an advertising and design firm, I learned you can never show somebody a visual without them being literally attached to that. I use the word literally. Literally attached to what that is, because as soon as they see a visual, that's what they think. You know, it's, they don't. People don't understand roughs. <laughs> Just, well, that's not what I meant. I understand. You're saying use the the I engine. Use the engine to replace PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's a potential there. I mean, I'm. Uh, but yeah, even if you show your art in the engine, like as part of your game pitch, you <coughs> you, you run the risk of people. Um, Interpreting that as your game, oh. and it just blew up. <laughs> Good in the back. Actually, there was a some. I don't want to say studies, it's not a bad idea. that sounds too academic, but there was some examples. of oh, sorry, <clears throat> there was some examples of people realizing they weren't as successful when they had demos because people would see the demos and be like, "All right, this is what I got. This is what we're going for," and they get too attached. And then they, I mean, they, there's games we played here today that we probably played a year ago, and we're like, "Wow, this is different than what we expected already." So. Working off that, you got to be careful because people will think, "Okay, this is what we got," and they're focused. They've got this predisposition thing. And you got to be careful with that. You don't want to have them work to read what you don't have on the screen, um, and use. You, know, you you're much better off just having the imagination. I mean, we've always called them paper pitches in the industry, where you know it's it. You're you're not actually showing a proof of concept or a, an, a you know an early demo. It's it is it's almost death. <laughs> so let me get this straight. Are we at, are we suggesting that we that game developers do not use lean startup methodology to generate a fan base and, and build hype and interest in their game before they release? No. I don't I don't think that was the topic. I think we're talk, that was we're in like uh, a scenario of individual investors rather than say like a Kickstarter if you right, will. Right. Um yeah, and, or a green light or anything. And, and with and with saying that you know you don't you present visuals. I mean, but what about you know, no, I, just, I didn't say we don't present oh, visuals. You know, concept you art, tone videos, yeah. all that stuff is great. And I was just talking about pitching to publishers and investors. Yeah. yeah, there are other ways. I mean, if you're doing a Kickstarter, which at this point I think might be insane, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> then showing work in progress to other other players mm -hmm. might work. Ah, okay. Different different sort of thing. Yeah. My misunderstanding. Well, and, uh, to quote Warren from yesterday, you know, minimum viable product right. it doesn't it, it doesn't inspire people. I mean, it, it's it's just it doesn't inspire potential investors. They like to know that it's a least cost route. They're trying to get money the f fastest and prove there's a market. Sure. So in the product market fit scenario, uh, you gotta you. But that's not the way you build a game. I mean, it's it's counter in most it, to my philosophy of how you yeah, build. Let's, let's have the conversation about MVP. I don't know. Good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta look this way too. You've Sorry. been ignoring this. Oh, apologize. It's I went too bit, far. No, no, it's okay. I, I it's appreciate okay. that. Take him. It's fine. Go ahead. So we're trying to basically. Uh, I'm taking away from this with the, the no demo approach. We're trying to get the investors to buy a pig and a poke. We're trying to get them to take the risk without there being any. I mean. It, I guess it's so different to the workflow that I'm used to, where you prototype something out and it's fun or it's not. How do you, how do oh, you yeah. <coughs> sell them on the fun if you're not showing them something that's the demo? I wanted to add to that. So the flip side, I wanted to go there further. I want to ask this direct question. In your world right now, Tetris doesn't exist. You created it. It's done. How do you pitch that to somebody who wants to either slap a stupid story onto it and can't see the potential of what would happen if a world didn't have Tetris and it showed up today. How do you pitch that concept right there? That's the one I want to know. And that's the full game already working, not just the prototype. No, I don't think we're saying you don't ever show a prototype. That's not my point. But it has to be ready. Prototyping Tetris would be trivial is a dangerous word in software development, OK? Uh, it is not dependent on graphics. Right. Uh, right. My games are dependent on, and, and I would argue most AAA games, most AAA games are dependent on a certain level of graphical fidelity and quality that you can't achieve early on. 
I mean, it's just, it's, and the inter interaction of a bunch of different game systems is where the fun comes from. It's very hard to get that across. So, so how and do if you you're, pitch? If your game, if, if you've got placeholder art and you're pitching to electronic arts, you, you will be dead at the early stages. The other thing I wanted to say was there are different, different there are different context. necessities at different phases of yeah. a project, and there are always different pitches to different audiences. That's why you have to understand who you're pitching to. If, right, you're, so if you're pitching to me, I might understand work in progress. If you're pitching to the CEO of the Walt Disney Corporation, he's not going to get it. He might not even get Tetris with placeholder art, though Tetris actually shipped with placeholder art. So, <laughs> I mean, so how do you pitch Tetris? That's the question. Well, not, yes. not that if Tetris had more art or something. How do you actually pitch and Tetris? He, he answered it by, it depends on who you're pitching okay. Tetris to. Because you have to align your pitch to your audience. No, and again, a, how do you pitch? It's a, it's a, you it's a bad Tetris? example. It is it's a, a bad it's example. A challenging. Because, well, because he's got puzzle games, so he's trying to be the next Tetris. Probably had Tetris done. Before it was, he was one guy working yeah. alone, and and it had no artwork. He probably had the game finished when he went out pitching it to four hundred companies in Japan. Right? But what I'm saying is, how do you pitch that today? Well, do you just show Tetris and say, "Can't you guys have the vision to see how this will take over the no world?" No one will invest no, in, in a Tetris game. What? If you're pitching a game that you finished, then the next question out of their mouths is, "What are the results?" Yeah. So where have you already put it, right? Tell them, tell them how many thousands or millions of units been downloaded. Tell them, you know, how many sales that you've generated. Tell them what market share you're getting. Tell them, you know, what other games have been spawned from it. You know, okay. Like that. Or and, and and to your point, you've got five titles. It's it's as it's better than anything I've ever made, and my best is doing this right now. You know, you're you're going to have to live on your own credibility at some level. It, not always. If you're just starting, obviously, um, there's lots of ways to break in. But if you're talking about pitching a puzzle game, um, you're going to have to say where the hook is and why this is going to have a sim similar trajectory to another title that's already had a, a certain number of units sold. This yeah. is this is the next block, and this is why mm -hmm. it's going to capture right. yeah. capture the imagination of the audience today. It's, it's the market timing is perfect for this. Sure. Okay. What, what I've seen a lot of successful um, Kickstarters do, um, when you're looking at the really early stages of them, is that they establish why they're excited about this gap in the market and why their game or project fills it and why they're, they're the particular person to work on it. And then from there, once people are invested in the idea of it and are on board with the excitement of the developer, then once you start releasing these super early prototypes and wireframes and whatnot, that's when you can actually show these in-engine things and because there's a progression from there and they're already invested in the idea, that's when the prototypes and whatnot are um, like a viable thing to show to people. And you can basically reverse engineer a Kickstarter and what are the reasons you don't buy in? You don't believe in the team, you don't believe it's a concept that, you know, you can, you can look at all the reasons why you don't uh, end up uh, supporting one. Yeah. I'm not as negative on Kickstarters as uh, some people because I know that for the number uh, that fail, 80% of board, card, and miniatures are succeeding on Kickstarter. So it's a matter of selling what people are buying. <laughs> it works if you have the right scope, scale, and uh, opportunity there. But a lot of us aren't building those types of uh, entertainment experiences. And it also works to build community. It actually helps to do as a marketing. When you don't need the money, you're doing it primarily just to get visibility and, and recognition out in a social network behind what you're doing. One thing that might be relevant um, in terms of you know, pitching here in Atlanta and the Southeast is uh -huh. who the investors are. So I did a fundraise last year. I'm also a member of ATA. Um, there's basically less than a dozen funds here in Atlanta. There's a couple of in the Southeast. Um, there's maybe a few hundred um, real angel investors that are active. Okay. Um, and, there, and none of them are just hearing game ideas. Right. You're being compared to cloud companies. Yep. You're being compared to health care security ideas. You're being compared to devices. Um, and I think you have to present the, propose the question: Why should you consider even this category? Yep. Um, you mentioned that you know none of the investors were willing to really take any of the ideas from yesterday seriously. I mean that. I it wasn't game stuff mostly though here. So. Okay. Yeah, but I think it's you know that's that's a I think here in Atlanta anyway, um, maybe different San Diego or some other places. Um, why should you even consider this category is probably a relevant part of the, I mean, the pitch for the initial conversation. 
I think there's some very good data supporting it that I don't think the investor he really is, he really is aware of. Well, and I've found in different regions like this, a lot of times what they're comfortable in investing in is not necessarily what the next big thing is. And so even when they're going to do their due diligence and the rest, they don't even know who they're going to call that's going to give them uh, background on the category you're in. So it becomes difficult, and they're, again, knowing your audience, understanding what their appetite is, and aligning with what they're actually interested in. That in, or getting them interested and giving enough information about what you're pitching in order to, um, it, it, it's, it's education, right? It's, it's, go ahead, Warren. Yeah, a, a variation on what you just said, yeah. actually. Um, you have to go into a pitch understanding that you're not necessarily even trying to sell yourself. I mean, you are, right? But, but one of the most important things is telling them how you're gonna solve their problem. Yeah. Okay, yeah. if you're going in for a job interview, how are you going to help them with the thing that's broken at their company? Uh, don't be a jerk about that, by the way. Uh, don't go in there and say, you guys are terrible at AI, and I'm going to fix that. But, but know what problem they have and find a way to present yourself as the solution. And that's the same thing with a game pitch. Yeah. You know, the Disney, I mean, I, I realize my experience is very different, you're, right? You're in a different but, tier. Yeah. But it, I think, it, I think it, it generalizes pretty well. <clears throat> Disney wanted credibility in the AAA game space. And I could help them meet that need. And I knew that going in that that was what they were trying to do. Okay, So know what problem you're going to solve and be the person who's going to solve it. Number one, up there. <laughs> oh, find it even fill it. Yeah. 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 Except I would say it, it's it's a problem. <laughs> Not no, a okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. The, the problem solution component in any, I mean, so an investor is trying to figure out how to get return on an investment. They're, they're looking at reducing risk and increasing reward. And you've got to be able to show how your team is a better bet and how your idea is not only uh, the right one, but the right timed one. Timing, a lot of people will be ahead of a market. I mean, hell, Kurzweil spent all this time just putting a think tank together so he could figure out where the bell curve was so he could start building uh, ideas at Google now <laughs> for when it was the right uh, time. Uh, everybody read Singularity in here? It's a fascinating, you know, meta trends of today, uh, or yesterday, now it's gotten kind of dated, hasn't it? <laughs> but just being, um, that's another thing that is uh, interesting people get people interested. Um, be more than just in your own world be able to relate to people in their world. And so if you are well informed and have a stronger world view than just video games, and you can speak to you know, a consumer trend or you know, what's going on in Asia that's now coming this direction, being able to have a larger context is gonna give you a better way to find levels of connection with, with the people that you're pitching to. So try to make sure that you're um, as you're building your own brand, as you're creating your own reputation. I talk a lot about, it's not, I mean, the education is a tick box. Once you've ticked that box, that just puts you in, uh, that just qualifies you to get the interview. It doesn't make it, you more interesting or less interesting. I guess maybe unless you're dropping out of a PhD. <laughs> but, but look then at what, what is it that differentiates you in any situation, and frequently one of those major factors is who you know. It's your network. It's knowing that you know the guy who's actually going to tell you what they're interested in, doing the back, background research, understanding who the manager is that you're going in to interview with. That network and being able to do the research you need to to understand an organization well enough to know what problem you're going to be solving for them is a lot about who you know. And um, being at a conference like this is like one of the first steps, right? Get to know the people who you want to work with and that you want to have their fingerprints on your life if you're going to go to work for a company. Uh, find a way to intern for them. Get in front of those individuals. Yeah, just that's a great point. Uh, I spoke at Georgia Tech the other day. I spent two days at Georgia Tech. Uh, I've been here for two days, and I believe it, it is literally, which is one of my favorite words, by the way. I overuse, I overuse that word. But I, I'm pretty sure two people have told me their names. Two. 
you. Come on, guys. Did they have business cards? Uh, I've gotten two or three business. I hate getting business cards, by the way. <laughs> okay. But I, I throw them in a drawer and I never look at them again. It's your responsibility to get back in touch with me, not the other way around. Yep. Yep. Uh, but have them. You should, you should have them and give them out. Uh, I don't, Warren, <laughs> do you even remember when we met? Honestly. <laughs> Because we didn't even link into like 2011 or something like that. But <laughs> oh, sorry. I was I was at uh, Sierra back in. It was here in Atlanta. Remember E3 in Atlanta here? I yeah, I do remember. Yeah, that. I was. That I was, was like a 400 years ago. I know. <laughs> yeah, I was a brand manager at Sierra. Um, you don't know want Tra Schwader? No. But Joe in Canada. I'm from Canada. You know Joe? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a bad joke. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's mean. Yeah, I was just going to say something. I was a little late, so if I'm saying anything redundant. No, you just didn't get to introduce yourself, so we don't know who you are. Yeah, so Adam stand up. Coons. Yeah. Hey, what's that? Stand up. Okay. Adam Coons. Um, I was the CEO of Mobley here in Atlanta. I'm now up in New York and run operations for Seed Feed. Um, so anyway, what I was going to say is... Uh, I know a lot of we were talking a little bit about crowdfunding right when I came in, and um, everybody's kind of focused on rewards-based crowdfunding, but with the passage of Reg A+, Plus, as that develops over the coming year, I just encourage anybody that has an adamant fan base for what they're actually creating. You just used some words so, I don't even know what they what's mean. That? <laughs> oh, Reg A+, Plus is actually the new law that allows everybody to do equity crowdfunding. So rewards-based crowdfunding, where you're actually giving out figurines or something like that, you can give out stock to non-accredited investors in your company. Um, this is, you have to go through a lot of filings. You don't want to be the guinea pig with the SEC, so I encourage everybody to wait a little bit you know, for some more people to do that. For uh, FIG to figure yeah, it out. An example out of, but there is a lot of opportunity there um, where you can actually get out stock and then you can have a shared interest with your community um, in the game success of your game company. Someday if you ever want to hear about, I did a DPO, a direct public offering for a franchise restaurant organization once. I learned all the things never to do again. <laughs> okay, so where are we at on time? I haven't paid any attention. I'll stop. Okay. So, life is a pitch. Um, one of the things that I encourage anybody who's trying to get better at this, and it is a lifelong passion. You'll never be done learning how to... Go ahead, you had a question. Okay. You, so, at the point where you're trying to build a context for this, get better at it, you know, as Warren said, get used to being in front of the room, get used to uh, networking and, and, you know, I wear a purple shirt right now, I've worn a yellow orange shirt. Usually you can find me in the room because I'm, a, I'm one of the guys that has a group of people around me talking. And if you look down, it's because you have to be engaging, you have to find a way to find that common context. I just want to support that. I, I can't even tell you, think about it this way, if you're uncomfortable speaking in front of people, yeah. just remember, there are only two times in your life when people have no choice but to listen to you. <laughs> Therapy and pitching. <laughs> they have no choice. And it's sometimes like it can be both. That. It's the <laughs> I'm sorry, what, what, what? Sometimes it can be both. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, there you go. Um, just remember that and have fun with it. You yeah. know? It's, yeah. it's, a, it's an amazing experience watching 40 people looking at you. Yeah. It's cool. And this is the perfect place to even try it. I, I would think. I mean, uh, yeah, we're we're all here at a gaming convention, but I mean, you're going to see several badges that say, you know, members or investors or uh, sponsors and stuff like that. I mean, th this place is a is a wide open ear and with open arms to hear your pitch or, or even practice it. I think I've I've already practiced it on several people this weekend. Yeah, I, <clears throat> you you may you may catch a big fish. You may not. Yeah. They they so I just flew in from it. Vegas. What was that? <laughs> I didn't hear you. I was talking. I just flew in from Vegas. I signed up for the world market, which is uh, 350,000 square feet of space. And I'm going to launch the Con of Cons this year. It's where everybody gets to bring their con into one big tent. <laughs> That's what I'm pitching right now. So if you know anybody who should have a community-based consumer event that they want to have hosted in Vegas June 23rd to the 25th, Talk to me. Okay. June 20th or 20th. I'm going to finish with that, but there's lots more conversation to have. I will be very disappointed if people don't, it, who want to use my network, don't come and introduce themselves to me and, and, and do that over the, the course of this uh, conference. Now, we've got another session going on after this, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Momentarily. Momentarily. In a minute. So thank you. Thanks.